Broadcasting is ruled by the clock. You must learn to match your delivery to the specific time requirements. This can be vitally important, as in the case of network commercials, or other situations where timing may be vital. Your rate of speech can affect the meaning of what you're saying. Take the phrase, I never felt so tired in my life. If you say it at a fast rate, I never felt so tired in my life, it sounds strange, doesn't it? Now say the same line at a slow rate. I never felt so tired in my life. This way the rate fits the meaning. It's obvious that your rate of speech has an important bearing on the interpretation of what you're saying. The mood or feeling behind what you're saying usually suggests the pace to follow. In this next paragraph, let's change the rate or tempo whenever it seems to be appropriate. The next moment, hardly knowing how it happened, Tom found himself tangled in the underbrush. He'd been thrown from the car on impact. Painfully, he pulled himself up. He flexed his limbs one by one, almost expecting to find broken bones. The back of his left hand was swollen. There was a slight cut on his left leg that he could see through a rip in his trousers. But miraculously, other than that, he seemed to be intact. He walked unsteadily to the car. The grill was badly mangled, and the radiator was dripping a dark pool on the snow. Tom climbed behind the wheel. He saw by his watch that he had only a half hour to make it. He was almost afraid to try the starter. He turned the key, and the engine roared to life. It was running. He glanced quickly at the dash panel. Oil pressure, ammeter, fuel, temperature, everything looked all right. He backed the damaged car onto the highway then into high gear for Syracuse. The speedometer climbed quickly. 60, 70, 80. The dark ribbon of road peeled out behind him. The needle climbed to 90. Tom grinned. This was it. He was back on his own private speedway. He'd make it after all. But suddenly, clouds of blue-gray smoke rolled out from under the dash. Oil. There was a leak. The car began to slow of its own accord. The smoke grew thicker. His speed dropped to 30, 15, and he rolled the stricken car onto the shoulder of the road. That's an example of how rate can affect the mood of what you're saying. In this particular case, the action that was taking place was directly reflected by variations in rate. The rate of speech, or the number of words per minute, varies from person to person. It also depends on the type of material that's involved. Obviously, if you were announcing a detailed report on highway conditions, you would adopt a slower rate than if you were doing a bright and enthusiastic commercial. One would be slow and deliberate, so that the listener could absorb the important details. The other would be animated and lively. Here's an example of what I mean. Here's a special word of caution to commercial truckers and others traveling Highway 75 today. Be on the lookout for dangerous road conditions, about seven miles south of Midwest Junction. If you're heading north, remember the east-west hairpin can't be seen from a distance. It was the scene of a serious accident this morning. That's approximately 50 words, and our time was 23 seconds. Now let's time the commercial. It's here, Florida Orange, a new refreshment thrill. Serve it ice cold at parties and picnics, with lunch and midnight snacks. It's as cool and crisp as a December sleigh ride. The taste of sparkling Florida Orange will heighten the fun, brighten the occasion. When you want refreshment, serve ice cold Florida Orange. Well, that too is approximately 50 words, but our time was only 18 seconds. Our commercial was a full five seconds faster yet the number of words is about the same. My approach in the first announcement was to slow down so the listener would be able to absorb the important details of the message. In the commercial, I wanted to sound animated and enthusiastic. Increased enthusiasm means increased rate. A rough guide for most kinds of broadcasting is about 150 words per minute. That would be just a shade faster than the announcement about highway conditions and a little slower than the commercial. Time yourself on both these announcements 
and see how close you come to the time I just recorded. Your timing shouldn't vary by more than a few seconds either way. Key words or phrases in a script can be stressed by slowing your rate. This has much the same effect as using the pause for emphasis. After you've slowed down to emphasize a certain point, speed up after you've created the desired effect. Here's an example. Can anyone be truly satisfied with his accomplishments? It's usually better to remain a little discontented. Day by day, we should naturally expect to see our abilities increase. But this will only happen if we keep working and striving. One wise man put it this way. If what you have done yesterday still looks good to you, you haven't done much today. And that, ladies and gentlemen, captures the simple essence of what I'm trying to say. That's an example of highlighting a key idea by slowing the rate. To heighten the effect, I speed it up on the line that followed. It's also possible to increase emphasis by speeding up your rate. Here's an example of this technique. Do you ever sit around on a summer night feeling vaguely restless? You're a little bored with everything and you wonder what to do? Here's my answer. I jump in the car and go to a ball game. Get out in the fresh air, eat hot dogs, and have a whale of a time. Maybe that's what you're missing. Try it sometime. You can see from these examples that emphasis can be increased by both slowing down and speeding up. When words or phrases are not too important to the overall meaning of what you're saying, try speeding up your rate in order to lessen the importance of these words. This helps to throw away the insignificant ideas and to highlight the truly important ones. The term horsepower, as it relates to automobiles, can be extremely misleading. The advertised horsepower has little bearing on how much power is delivered to the rear wheels under actual driving conditions. If you could equate horsepower to performance, things would be fairly simple, but it's much more involved than that. Horsepower generated by the engine has many jobs to do besides moving the wheels. There's the water pump, the fan belt, the generator, the power steering, the drive shaft, the differential. All of these absorb horsepower and plenty of it. As a matter of fact, you'd be amazed at the actual rear wheel horsepower delivered by most modern cars. Believe it or not, what's left to drive the car is only about one half what you started out with. As you can see, a change of pace is another useful item to add to your vocal equipment. A change of pace can emphasize the important ideas and underplay the others. Stress is used not only to highlight certain words and ideas when we speak, but it's also a key part of pronunciation. Words of two or more syllables usually have one syllable that carries more stress than others. Here are some examples. Anyway, commercial, narration, articulation, discreet, contents, formidable, economy, pronunciation, Converse, merciful, memorable. The syllable that carries the main stress is called the accented syllable. Whenever you're in any doubt about which syllable to stress, look it up in a dictionary and say the word over several times aloud to implant the pattern of stress in your mind. Some words are stressed differently depending on whether they're being used as nouns, adjectives, or verbs. Knowing when to change the stress will add considerable polish to your speech and lend added authority to what you say. Here are some common examples. The convict was serving a three-year sentence. The evidence of the key witness was all it took to convict him. A transfer was being planned for the company's general manager. The board of directors decided to transfer him to another city. A protest was lodged against the unfair treatment. If the workers didn't approve, they had the right to protest. The conflict was caused by outside interference. Outside interference caused their activities to conflict. His conduct left much to be desired. His anxiety caused him to conduct himself in a strange way. His exploit was covered by hundreds of newsmen. He hoped to exploit the publicity to the full. 
It's almost a general rule that the first syllable is stressed when words of this kind are used as nouns, and that the stress is shifted to the last syllable when they're used as verbs. There are a few exceptions to this rule, such as consummate. This is stressed on the first syllable, con. But when the word is used as an adjective, the stress shifts to the second syllable. This is the reverse of the usual rule. Here's an example. The salesman hoped to consummate the arrangements the following week. The salesman presented his story with consummate skill. Here's another exception to the rule. Because of the fast pace, it was necessary to alternate the two athletes. Because of the fast pace, the two athletes performed in alternate 10-minute periods. Yes, there are one or two exceptions, which is true of almost every rule in the English language. But in almost all cases, the stress is on the first syllable when the word is used as a noun or adjective, and on the second syllable when it's used as a verb. Make a list of all the words you can where this rule applies, and check your list against the pronunciation in a good dictionary. In longer words containing three and four syllables, more than one syllable is stressed. One syllable usually carries the main stress, another will have secondary stress, and the rest will have weaker stress. Here are some examples. Responsibility, communication, deterioration, misunderstanding, association, inflexibility, microscopic, connoisseur. Having the stress on the right syllables adds to the melody and rhythm of your speech. Most dictionaries mark words for primary and secondary stress. Whenever you're in doubt, look it up. It's often just as important to good speech not to stress certain syllables and words. The vowels and unstressed syllables should be treated lightly and weakly. They should be almost blurred. For example, you obviously wouldn't say responsibility, communication, inflexibility. The weak or unstressed vowels would be almost thrown away. Responsibility, communication, inflexibility. You may have noticed that throughout this course, I've used many contracted forms of speech. This is another important part of stress. Instead of saying, I have used contractions, the more natural way of speaking is to say, I've used. I've used its instead of it is, their instead of they are, and we're instead of we are. This helps to add a natural quality to speech. When you use the longer, formal approach, you tend to sound unnatural and overly careful. Here are some other recommended contractions for informal speech. Where's the nearest drugstore? He doesn't know which way to go. I'll go to the station to meet the train. She hasn't been around for years. Weren't you planning to attend the meeting? I'd like to take a trip. Of course, there are occasions when these words must be stressed. When the meaning requires it, it's necessary to use the full word. Where is the nearest drugstore? He does not know which way to go. I will go to the station to meet the train. Whenever you can, use the contracted form, as long as it doesn't affect the sense of what you're saying. Now, let's consider words to stress in phrases and sentences and how stress can affect the meaning. Emphasis, remember, is simply a means of making your meaning clear to the listener. First, you must understand the meaning of what you're saying, and the pattern of stress will automatically become clear. Generally speaking, the words that are normally stressed in most sentences are those that name objects, people, or places, the words that help to describe them, and the verbs are words of action. The connecting parts of speech, the prepositions and conjunctions, are usually thrown away. So are the articles the, a, and an. To show how meaning and stress are interwoven, let's move the stress from word to word in a sample sentence and see how the meaning changes. You said you went to the nearest store. 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 Another rule of stress is that in any context, it's the new words or ideas that receive the stress. Words or ideas that have been mentioned previously become subordinated, and when they're repeated, they're underplayed. 
the new or modifying thoughts about them are highlighted. Here's an example of misplaced stress. In Chicago last night, a 23-year-old man was critically injured in a traffic accident. George Smith is suffering from extensive injuries, including a fractured skull. It was the 18th serious pedestrian accident this month in Chicago. Smith stepped in front of a car on Madison Avenue and was rushed to Chicago General Hospital. The driver of the car says he had no chance to avoid Smith and that the injured man stepped into the traffic stream against a red light. You can see what happens if you stress words or ideas that have already been mentioned. This time I'll try to stress or highlight the new ideas as they appear and underplay the repeated ideas. In Chicago last night, a 23-year-old man was critically injured in a traffic accident. George Smith is suffering from extensive injuries, including a fractured skull. It was the 18th serious pedestrian accident this month in Chicago. Smith stepped in front of a car on Madison Avenue and was rushed to Chicago General Hospital. The driver of the car says he had no chance to avoid Smith and that the injured man stepped into the traffic stream against a red light. There are two basic kinds of pauses, the natural pause and the pause for emphasis. The natural pause separates ideas and gives the speaker a chance to breathe. The pause for emphasis is a deliberate pause before or after an important word or phrase. The pause for emphasis is used to draw special attention to an important point. The correct use of the pause is one of the most effective techniques an announcer can master. It's best to forget what you may have learned in grammar school about commas and periods and other formal punctuation. As I've said before, these marks are mainly a guide to the eye. They may still apply in most cases in the way you talk, but it's best to forget these rules and learn to pause between ideas or groups of ideas. Let's remember that the natural pause separates ideas for our listeners and gives us a chance to take a breath. We've already covered the fact that there are no hard and fast rules about phrasing, so it naturally follows that the same thing applies to pausing. Here's an example of a spoken paragraph using the natural pause to separate ideas and to take on a new supply of air. I'll mark the script with oblique strokes. One stroke will mean a slight pause with no breath. Two strokes will mean a longer pause and a chance to breathe. Some people claim middle age starts at 30, some say 35. Middle age, for me, started one morning a couple of months ago, when I found myself reeling after bending over to tie my shoelace. There I was, 48 years old, still with half my hair, and pretending I hadn't changed a bit since I was 21, except for 40 pounds of extra suet. The depression was only a couple of years ago, and World War II had happened yesterday. My awakening was almost as startling as Rip Van Winkle's. A friend of mine once wrote, you are getting old when policemen begin to look young. He was right. Now I know why women hate to admit their age, and why Jack Benny stopped counting birthdays at 39. Obviously, the short pauses represented only minor breaks in thought. Had these pauses been longer, the overall effect would have been choppy and disjointed. The longer pauses were made where there were distinct changes in ideas. These were the natural breathing stops. Now let's consider the pause for emphasis. Supposing you're about to reach an important point in what you're saying, and you want to be sure the point sinks in with your listener. To create the best effect, you should slow down slightly before you reach the point you intend to stress. When you reach it, make a deliberate full stop. Then deliver your punchline with plenty of emphasis. Here's a demonstration of the pause for emphasis used before you make the point. Whatever old age is, it isn't a time to start gallivanting around the country in a car or gallivanting around the world on a cruise ship. Old age should be a time to sit back near a fire and reminisce about the trips and cruises you took when you were still young enough to enjoy them. I suppose I hate middle age because I miss being young. As George Bernard Shaw said, 
Youth is such a wonderful time of life. It's a shame to waste it on the young. Slow down before you reach the point you want to emphasize. Pause before you say it. Say it with lots of emphasis. There's another kind of pause for emphasis. You can achieve much the same effect by pausing after an important point rather than before it. This technique also calls for slowing down before you reach the point to be stressed, then delivering the line with lots of emphasis, and then pausing for effect. To heighten the effect, pick up the tempo a little after the pause. Let's try it. Do you remember the words of Woodrow Wilson when he was campaigning for the formation of the League of Nations? He said, There will come some time in the vengeful providence of God another struggle in which not a few hundred thousand fine young men from America will have to die, but as many millions as are necessary to accomplish the final freedom of the peoples of the world. I'm sure you'll agree, gentlemen, that these were prophetic words. In some cases, a combination of these two pauses can be useful. Supposing in a commercial announcement, we want to give special emphasis to the name of a product or a sponsor's slogan. We can set these important ideas apart from the rest of the context by pausing slightly both before and after the key words or ideas. Here's what I mean. So remember that advice on good grooming, men. Ask for it at your favorite drugstore. Luster hair tonic. Helps keep life in your hair, helps keep your hair for life. As you can hear, a short pause before and after the name of the product helps to set it apart and give it additional emphasis. There's one kind of pause the announcer should never use. That's the verbal pause. This is a bugbear that usually shows up in ad lib work. It indicates a groping for words and an uncertainty about what to say next. Here's how it sounds. The weather is uh, not very good today. It's been raining and uh, the wind has been cold and uh, gusty. We've been waiting at our location here for, uh, oh, about 15 or uh, 20 minutes. But so far there is no sign of uh, our honored guests. If you must grope for words, it's far better to grope for them silently. The pauses may seem like an eternity to you, but they won't sound overly long to the listener. By eliminating the verbalized pause, you'll sound a lot more interesting and authoritative. Let's try the same thing with no verbal pauses. I'll take even more time to say the same things, but my pauses will be silent ones. The weather is not very good today. It's been raining and the wind has been cold and gusty. We've been waiting at our location here for about 15 or 20 minutes. But so far, there's no sign of our honored guests. I'm sure you'll agree that slow as it is, it still sounds better by eliminating O's and A's. It's also worth remembering that with the right kind of pause, the continuity of thought continues, even when you're silent. By using the right pitch and inflection, the thought carries through the pause, no matter how long it is. Now we're waiting for the referee to gather the judges' scorecards. Now he has them all and he's heading for the center of the ring. He's looking them over carefully with the ring announcer. Now we'll have the decision. That covers natural pauses and pauses for emphasis in their various forms. Practice the techniques you've learned in your everyday conversation, as well as in your vocal sessions. Remember, one good pause can often say more than 10 words. The announcer has a responsibility to his listeners to reflect the accepted and preferred standards of pronunciation. Unless you're absolutely sure of the acceptability of any pronunciation, look it up in a dictionary. Faulty pronunciation robs an announcer of his authority and acceptance with the discriminating listener. He is also viewed as a bad influence on children 
and the populace in general, so far as educated speech is concerned. Not only that, but mispronunciations lower his status as a professional within the trade, hold back his advancement, affect his earning power, and in extreme cases, even his employability. This is as it should be, because in most cases, there is no excuse for mispronunciation. However, the entire subject of pronunciation should be approached with a great deal of open-mindedness and flexibility. The pronunciation of many words varies from place to place and from time to time. There are no exact rules to cover all phases of pronunciation, nor are there any exact standards to follow. A dictionary reflects the general usage of words and the standards of pronunciation adopted by educated people. A dictionary lists preferred pronunciations and secondary pronunciations, either of which can be considered correct. However, no dictionary can be considered a binding law unto itself. Remember, it does not dictate pronunciation. It simply collects and records the way English is being used and spoken at the time of publication. If more than one pronunciation of a word is considered to be correct, an announcer should use the one that he feels will be most acceptable to the people in his audience. Somebody will always disagree with your selection of certain pronunciations, and with anything as flexible and changing as a language, this is to be expected. Here's a paragraph that contains some common errors in pronunciation, and other pronunciations that are not recommended. The advertisement in the newspaper of Wednesday, February 16th, was two columns wide. I have often seen ads of this kind. Someone was looking for a man who was genuinely interested in becoming a valet. The ad said it was preferable that any aspirant should be in robust health, hospitable by nature, interested in film work, and willing to become an integral part of the advertiser's household. It asked that the applicant send his name and address to Box 13, Rural Route 90, and that the details should be enclosed in a brown envelope. I thought that the entire approach was unprecedented. There were 23 pronunciations that were either wrong or were not the preferred pronunciations of those particular words. Let's read the paragraph again, this time with the proper pronunciation. The advertisement in the newspaper of Wednesday, February 16th, was two columns wide. I have often seen ads of this kind. Someone was looking for a man who was genuinely interested in becoming a valet. The ad said it was preferable that any aspirant be in robust health, hospitable by nature, and willing to become an integral part of the advertiser's household. It asked that the applicant send his name and address to Box 13, Rural Route 90, and that the details should be enclosed in a brown envelope. I thought that the entire approach was unprecedented. The words in question were advertisement, Wednesday, February, columns, often, genuinely, interested, valid, preferable, aspirant, robust, hospitable, film, integral, asked, address, 13, root, 90, details, envelope, entire, unprecedented. Check the pronunciation of these words in your dictionary. Some mispronunciations are the result of careless or sloppy speech rather than lack of knowledge. Here are some things to watch. Be sure to sound the full ing sound on words ending in ing. Going, seeing, calling, watching. Be sure to sound the final t in words such as left, swept, kept, accept, test. Always give full value to the consonant sounds in these words. Climactic, Antarctic, asked, district, hundred, risked, twelfth. Be sure you sound all of the syllables in words like this. Accidentally, boundary, cemetery, chocolate, diamond, February, itinerary, laboratory, medicine, 
occasionally, particularly. Leaving out syllables, vowels, and consonants account for most mispronunciations due to carelessness, but adding sounds that don't belong is also a problem at times. Here are some examples. First, I'll give you the wrong way, then the correct way. Wrong, athlete. Correct, athlete. Wrong, across. Correct, across. Wrong, disastrous. Correct, disastrous. Wrong, film. Correct, film. Wrong, grievous. Correct, grievous. Wrong, mischievous. Correct, mischievous. Watch the sound U in certain words. Say news, stew, and do, rather than news, stew, and do. It's a rule of English that the U sound is pronounced U as in news, except in the words so, shrew, and after J, R, and C when they're preceded by a consonant. The silent T can be another source of trouble. The most common example is the word often. This is one of the most commonly mispronounced words in the English language. Remember that T is silent in often. Other examples are apostle, epistle, soften, hasten. Here's a tip on proper names. Radio news wire services will usually spell proper names phonetically in stories they report if there's any doubt about the proper pronunciation. However, in local news stories, there's often no source of reference to guide you. If a deadline prevents you from determining the correct pronunciation by phoning or asking someone, here's a tip to remember. Look at the person's name and ask yourself, if this were my name, how would I pronounce it? You won't be right all the time, but you'll at least be right more often than you're wrong. When it comes to the pronunciation of foreign names, remember that you're not expected to pronounce these words exactly the same way a native would. Every announcer, though, should know the basic rules of pronunciation of at least French, German, and Spanish. You can find these in dozens of textbooks that are readily available, and there are some excellent recorded courses on the basics of many foreign languages. One excellent book that covers the names of cities and towns all over the world is World Words, printed by the Columbia University Press. For any announcer aspiring to become a newscaster, this is a valuable book to have around. Foreign place names have become anglicized through the years and are pronounced quite differently in English than they are in the native language. Some obvious examples are Paris, Rome, Marseille, Warsaw, Copenhagen, and Madrid. Good pronunciation stems from ingrained habit. Get into the habit of using your dictionary and constantly referring to it. Never use a word unless you're sure you know the accepted pronunciation. When you aren't sure, look it up.